taking this attitude with me. What happened is I was interviewed by someone who I shall not name unless you want to name him. Um, and at the, I had geared myself and prepared myself to show these, these great financial plans that I've been studying. I've been studying the city charter. I've been studying the city budget. I've been I'm watching the news and learning about pension plans, which is another, another snake in the basket coming around the corner, so to speak, double entendre. <laughs> but uh, I have all these ideas on how to save money and really work for this county, this for the city, rather. Maybe it's a baby in the basket, like Moses. Yes, Just kidding. <laughs> but what happened is when she wanted to focus the question on, and I'll go ahead and come clean with this now, Jaime, thank you. I apparently, to the best of my knowledge, I know it's on record, made a comment when I first started, naive. I, I said, I have been informed that two of you have a homosexual lifestyle or a gay lifestyle. Therefore, it is a conflict of interest to, for you to pass an ordinance that, that benefits that particular lifestyle. That is a fact. It may not be something people agree, but if I am in favor of mountain biking, I would want to pass a law that helps mountain bikers. That, that's just... Okay, can we not acknowledge that everyone has some sexual lifestyle? Ignor Either hetero or, or homosexual. But can everybody has some sexual lifestyle. Well, yeah. Otherwise, none of us would be here, right? Yeah, unless they're a vegetable, I guess. <laughs> right, okay. So, if someone were heterosexual and went the opposite way with that ordinance, couldn't they send, then argue the exact same thing you're arguing, that their sexuality is a conflict of interest? The difference being, Jaime, that the majority of El Pasoans have the lifestyle that promotes the laws or the rules that are being passed not in common with the one it is, it, it, or to put it a different way, in other words, the majority of El Pasoans are not living a lifestyle that would promote the benefits to non-married couples that was being proposed. Okay, so don't you feel though that it's always dangerous ground to open the door to asking questions about one's sex life? I mean, yes it is, and, and you know, I go back in my mind, in my prayer, nobody, it's, it's common knowledge I'm a minister and so forth, and I, and I really, really pray about this and say, who made this a public issue? I mean, sex is supposed to be a private thing behind closed doors. Ask yourself, who but made... But you raised the sexuality... But, but before me, who started, who made it a public, uh, a public forum thing? What group of people in our society made it public? It wasn't me. Wait, wait, so are, are we, uh, I just want, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I want to make sure I understand. So your argument is... Na 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 na. They started it. No, no. Let, let me explain. Let me explain a different way. The beginning of controversial sexual lifestyles was not brought about by the heterosexual. Okay, number one. It wasn't brought about by me. I came into this arena because City Hall, uh, unbeknownst to most of us, because they put it on a budget item, they didn't even put it. As far as I know, they they didn't make it a a, a referendum or, or put it up for a vote. I came into this arena when they had already decided to to make this benefit available to people who were not living a lifestyle in congruence, commensurate with the values of the majority of the taxpayers. That's the issue. When you have the majority of the taxpayers says, I promote or I endorse this lifestyle, why do you use my money for that lifestyle which I don't particularly endorse? Okay, well you know what, I'm not an avid uh, bike rider, but I don't really have a problem with you know, <laughs> some bikes. people having bike lanes. I mean, it's not my lifestyle, but one chooses to ride a bike. One's sexuality isn't chosen. Well, that's another argument. You know, that, that's a different. If you want to have a whole interview about, you can, I bring your you studies. You believe it's chosen? Well, you bring your studies, I'll bring my studies. You know, we'll so let the well, let me decide. ask you a very direct question. When did you choose to be straight? Okay. All of us are born, as I said earlier, with certain proclivities. As a minister, I have to say that the solution to those proclivities if they not be healthy and or wholesome and or biblical, is to be born by the Spirit of God. You understand not everyone believes in God. You understand that well, not everyone believes but, the way you do. But, but my, my job is to tell you my view on this particular item, and I'm being honest with you. I think the solution is uh, a godly life and live as the way God directs you to live. Okay, so that, okay, so, and you mentioning that actually brings me to my next question. You have raised sexuality. You have raised that <laughs> last point, and, 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 you've, and you've made that last point about you know living a godly lifestyle but you've also been very public about some other things when you were on the radio for example you had talked about some things you had done in your past you had talked about previous things that had gone on and i guess you have now changed that lifestyle obviously um i also understand though since you've raised the sexuality you open the door for yourself i also understand that you've spoken somewhere where you said that you were a sex addict <laughs> Well, is that accurate or inaccurate? It doesn't sound accurate to me. How do you define a sex addict? I don't know. I mean, I, in, my, in my book, every man is. <laughs> well, in that case, let's all join the group, you know. 
thank you for jumping in. You know, if you're referring to the fact that we all have room for improvement, if you're referring to the fact that we all need to come to a point in our lives when we say, wait a minute, do I live by my own human standards or do I look to a higher power to guide me? Yes, I've come to the point where I look to a higher power. And uh, when I come to things like sexuality or homosexuality or gay lifestyle and so forth that I don't fully understand, I go by what the Bible says. And if there was another book that was tested through time with more credence than that, I would look at that book. But that happens to be, in our society, the book of authority on morality. Before I was born, it was that way. I mean. In that very same chapter that you refer to in the Bible that talks about that, it also says that, you know, I can't help but notice you'd actually be breaking one of the rules set forth in the book of Leviticus because I notice you're clean shaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, do we you know, pick and choose which ones of the Bible or do we do the whole thing? I mean, you and I had this thing on our text, you know, our text messages went back and forth with this. Um, if, if you want to talk about religion, remember that the New Testament is a, com a fulfillment of the Old Testament. OK, and so now we're not going by the Old Testament. Well, no, we're saying that, that Christ living in Christ fulfills the Old Testament. If I am loving God in you, my neighbor, I am fulfilling I am fulfilling the, the uh, law. That confuses me, though, because Christ never mentions homosexuality at all, ever. Well, Though he does mention adultery. Well, I, I didn't mention homosexuality in the answer I just gave you, and that is to be living in Christ. If someone is living in Christ, homosexual or not, he is right with God. Okay. Did you hear that? So, you know, you can have proclivities and desires, but if you're being ruled by the Spirit of God and you're surrendered to the Spirit of God, no matter what your proclivities or your, your, your uh, what is it, propensities and desires are, if you're in His will, you are rightful in His eyes. You're part of the El Pasoans for traditional family values, is that the correct thing? I, 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 was, I was a member of that group when they started. That's what got me, in, it got me into this place. I just came here to listen. And then I found the fiscal problems that we have, and that's my focus. Right, there. and you've kind of branched off into that. Now, and we'll move on back into the fiscal stuff, but this is how you entered the political sphere. So oh, this is why we're examining it yes. right now, because right. that's how you kind of entered yes. the fray. I appreciate that, yes. Um, you had mentioned in a previous forum that a mentor had, had actually, you know, it was at his behest that you started getting involved in this. He invited me to come and stand Who was that mentor? Barney Field. Okay. Right, he's my pastor. Okay. Um, what is your marital status? I am single. Divorced? No. You never been married? Never been married. Never been married. You have children? I have a daughter uh, by adoption. And that's, uh, I don't know if I want to get into it right now, but it's, uh, I, don't, I want to protect her privacy. But she, she, let's just say God put her in my life and he put her in my life and me in her life. And that uh, goes back to uh, a kind of a fatherly adoption issue that uh, I'm not, out of courtesy to her and her privacy, I, I don't want to get into that right well, now. I'm not asking her name, but well, I yeah. mean, I, so you are the legal father of her through adoption? No, it, no, it's not. Uh, it's not I asked because on your website you've yeah. mentioned your grandchildren. Yes. And then yes. I asked you your marital yes. status, and yes. since you're part of the yeah. uh, Passwords for Traditional Family Values, I wonder, wouldn't some people in that very group say and characterize that as maybe not the most traditional? Uh, yes, let me admit that I do not have a traditional family. But again, Jaime, to, to be in favor of something and aspire to it does not mean that I'm condemning people that don't have. I think it's something we should aspire to and we should pass laws that promote that or encourage that. But please, I am not, uh, uh, I don't want to hurt people that are struggling with a non-traditional family, not at all. Any more than a coach would punish the, 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 uh, the, the members of his team that don't get a gold medal, he still pats them on the back and he still encourages them, but it's the gold medal that we want to shoot for. Sure. So let's move on into the, uh, the, another comment that you had made during that interview, and it was about, um, I believe it was about unions and, and police department and stuff like that. I think you wanted to clarify a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, th you th yeah, thank you. Well, let, me, let me just say this. Thank you for letting me clarify that when I had that interview, it was focused on that uh, sexual thing so much that I, I lost my composure. But having put that aside now, I hope you know where I stand on that. I, I love all people. I don't mean any harm to any gay people at all. I think they will, they will answer to God just like I will. But I just didn't want to use tax dollars to promote a certain lifestyle. That's the end of that gay thing, I hope. Getting back to police now. Police is a very touchy subject because I need them for protection. I need their vote. And I think they're very important. They put their lives on the line. Here is where we start going 
I think, in a different direction. And I say this with all respect to Mr. Martin and all the uh, union, uh, police union and the fire people and so forth. When the city is struggling with a recession and with almost 11 percent unemployment, and we have written a contract, whoever wrote that contract guaranteeing the police X dollars for six years, I think it was, uh, it, it, they, they should have put a clause in there saying that it had to be connected to the city's economy for this reason. It, it, as, what good is it if we save our police department and keep them happy from not going to another city, which is the theory behind it, because they were being offered better deals somewhere else, Dallas and so forth. What good is that if we hurt the majority of our population? I don't think a good police officer in good conscience would want to hurt the overall uh, financial position of El Paso or the average income or the average voter. In other words, if it gets to the point where we're hurting uh, our, our taxpayers through property taxes so much that they can't enjoy the quality of life and, and the, the life that they've been enjoying before, I think the policemen themselves would say, you know what, I think our income and our retirement should be commensurate, should, should have some reflection of the financial climate of the city. And That's actually not what the uh, police well, officers... Well, I, then I would know. love to visit with them because it would be, wouldn't it be selfish to do the other side? I'll put in a formal well, question. Wouldn't it be selfish if I, as a particular uh, you know, worker, said, I don't care what your city's suffering, I want my money and I want it now. I, you know, I don't think that's exactly what's in most of their hearts. Okay. So you said something though that I found particularly interesting and that was you made a reference to if we don't take care of this situation we'll find ourselves in the same position as Wisconsin and yeah. you mentioned a couple of other states. Yes. Can you clarify to me what you meant by that? Yeah. But it, 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 it does have a little bit of a dog whistle type of mentality and I want to make sure that I don't unfairly um, characterize what you've had to say what, about that. What, what, I've, what I've discovered, uh, Jaime, is that um, because people are living longer and because the baby boomers are coming of age there is a tidal wave an economic uh, tsunami coming our way it starts at the federal level because our social security is is overburdened as it is and people are as i say are, are retiring at a greater amount because of the baby boomers and they're living longer and then you you that compounds itself through medicaid and medicare and we noticed it at the federal level. Now we noticed it at the state level through Wisconsin, Indiana, and other, you know, California is already bankrupt. So I think it's, it's coming here. So when we have our pension plans that are defined, uh, it's my understanding that, that when somebody retires right now through the uh, city, they get a defined amount until they die. Uh, and, and if that's the case, and we don't do something about the new employees coming in, I don't think we'll have enough money to pay all these pensions. So let me just be very frank with you and ask you point blank. Was your reference to Wisconsin an indication that you might try a tactic similar to what was done by the uh, establishment in Wisconsin to break up the power of unions? I don't think we're there yet. I don't think our, our, our where it's early enough to where... So that mean, is that a commitment that no, you wouldn't do it or at this, at you're this, not willing to commit I, either way? I would not do it at this time because we still have time to, to prepare. You know, if we tighten, so you're not eliminating it as an option. Well, only only God knows what's going to happen in four years. You know, if we don't do something, if we, as a matter of fact, let me let me let me say this: if we tighten our belt one notch right now, it's survivable and it's uncomfortable, but it's survivable. If we don't tighten our belt one notch, we could end up losing a, a bigger thing, and that's what's the difficult thing about running for office or political or all these issues that we're discussing is because nobody wants to feel the pain. But feeling a, sh a shot in the arm right now is better than losing the arm. And, uh, you know, Jaime, I'm going to say something. I don't know if you're getting ready to close now. But I'm going to say something mm -hmm. that's going to blow you away. But I want people to know this. I will give back my first year's salary if I cannot save the taxpayer $100 for every dollar they pay me. Let me say that again. I will give back. My, after my first year, I'll give back that salary my second year if I haven't saved the El Paso voter a hundred dollars for every dollar they pay me because I am that convinced that my efforts will save that if you know my efforts will be directed towards that I, I've done it in my business I'm, I'm living right now I, I was a real estate investor I was living on three times more money than I have now and I know I can do it I've studied business. every business has a place if you look if you look there's a way to be more efficient well, you, you, you talked about, and you've mentioned this before, that, uh, and you mentioned this in that, in that kind of contentious interview that you had, that you do charity work. Yes, sir. Okay. I do, yes, I do. How long have you been doing that? For five years, uh, when I became a minister, I searched for a charity that I, that I could put my heart into because I felt that